Hello everyone, Rahul Shah here, trying to make investing accessible and profitable for the average investor. As you would have already noticed, I have a special guest with me today on this Diwali special episode. He is none other than Ajit Dayal. Most of you know him as the founder of Equity Master, founder of Quantum AMC, a prolific writer and of course a prolific speaker. Now, uh, I actually wanted to have this episode a few weeks later, but Ajit insisted that we have it now during Diwali, uh, just for the, you know, uh, grandeur of this occasion. And there are a lot of things happening internationally, which Ajit felt uh, that he should, uh, you know, uh, talk about and educate our viewers. Uh, things like, you know, there are geopolitical conflicts happening. Uh, there are events happening in the United States, um, you know, the tug of war between inflation and interest rates. There are things happening back in India as well. So it was Ajit's wish that, you know, he speaks about these events, he shares his ideas and his viewpoints on these events with the audience. And uh, so we have a lot to talk about in this episode. I think it's going to be a cracker of an episode. So stay tuned. And let's uh, jump straight into this session. Ajit, welcome to this Diwali special on Equity Master. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here and <laughs> happy Diwali, happy new year to everyone watching. Thank you. So uh, I'll start this conversation on a lighter note. Uh, I think you've told me a couple of times that you have a very big sweet tooth. So any particular sweet that you most look forward to eating during Diwali? Rasgulla, Rasmalai, Gulab Jamun, <laughs> you name it. I love them all. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, even I'm a big lover of sweets. And Diwali is just a, such a fantastic occasion of, you know, having all these sweets and, you know, building wonderful memories. Mm -hmm. uh, now, talking of memories, uh, I want to talk about my first memory of you. This was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, 2003, uh, I was interviewing for the position of a research analyst at Equity Master. I had cleared the first couple of rounds of interviews and my last round of interview was scheduled with you. Uh, this was, I think, I still remember July 2003. And uh, the interview was one of the most unique of my career. Not that I've given a lot of interviews, but <laughs> this was uh, quite a unique interview and unique in a couple of ways. First, what usually happens in an interview is, you know, the candidate speaks for about 90% of the time and the interviewer, the prospective empl employer speaks for about 10% of the time. This was reverse. <laughs> I spoke for maybe about 10% of the time and 90% of the time it was you speaking. Because like you said, <laughs> I love speaking. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And secondly, uh, this was an interview for the position of research analyst. But there was, I don't remember a single question around research around fundamental analysis, around, uh, you know, how to pick multi-baggers, how to build spreadsheets and stuff. Most of the questions were around, you know, ethics, value systems, you know, moral principles. And of course, eventually I uh, got the job. Uh, but I thought that, you know, this is a typical organization where things like morals, ethics, values were given just lip service. And there was no seriousness to it. But Within a few months into my job and I realized that, uh, you know, this organization pays a lot of attention to morals, ethics, values, uh, that lives in day in and day out. Uh, I don't remember a single incident in my, <clears throat> you know, 18, 20 year career here at Equity Master where we've done something against the interest of the retail investor. Uh, you know, we've always tried to be retail investor's best friend, uh, do things in an ethical manner. Uh, and people may accuse us of, you know, sending those aggressive marketing emails. I think even you've accused us of that. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> and they may sometimes <laughs> accuse us of having a conservative investment approach of selling our stocks too early. Mm -hmm. But I think even uh, our biggest detractors would agree that, you know, we've stayed true to the principles of, uh, principles that we've, uh, you know, principles like being honest to your mm -hmm. subscribers, uh, always you know, thinking of ethics first. It does not matter uh, if we earn a few crores less or, you know, if we make 
loss uh, in any of the years, but as long as we are ethical and as long as we stay true to the principles, as, a, as long as we, you know, <clears throat> be a retail investor's best friend, that's what matters. Mm -hmm. And I think this is these are the principles that uh, you espouse not just at Equity Master, but al also at Quantum AMC. Mm -hmm and also at personal fn yes so i want to kick off this conversation uh, about this very thing you know uh, why does it matter so much uh, why why do ethics why do value systems matter so much and are we living in a world where you know you're getting a sense where these these principles and these moral val values are getting eroded so i guess i grew up very luckily in a joint family and one of the things that my uncles my parents my aunts had all taught me was just about a certain goodness way to approach life and specific, and 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 they never said do good things or whatever they never said that just like you watch them you learn from what they did and you absorb a certain path of life and i must say that my family was most you know they, we're not religious we don't go to temples we have a diwali puja my mother would have a little you know prayer session in her cupboard, she'd open the door and, you know, every morning, you know, Sai, Sai Baba, a few, right, but, yes. but there was no, there was no sort of inculcation of a doctrinate, if you will, on a religious perspective. And I think it all came to a head in 1981, after my undergrad from Jehan College in BA in economics, I got, an, I got admission into University of North Carolina at Chapel in the U.S. for an MBA program. And I went to the U.S. and my father, before I left, gave me a letter and he said, open this letter when you land in America. So like a true son, I took that letter, put it in my bag and opened it when I landed in America, in the US. And um, he gave me, it was like three pages. I still have the letter somewhere, not somewhere in, in my cupboard. And he basically said that when he left what is now Pakistan, grew up in Sindh, so we're Sindhis, and he left Pakistan to come in, what is now Pakistan, to come and study in Bombay to do the medical college here. His teacher then told him four words. And the words were, do good and be good. Okay. That's what my father wrote to me. And it sort of brought to a head all the stuff that I had unknowingly, subconsciously learnt as a child. So then having read those specific four words written by my father, I made sure that it acted as a guide for me through my education. And also, of course, when I came back to India, got a job and then, of course, started quantum. To the extent that in my last semester, in my university course, my MBA course, there was an investment banking course. Okay. And it accounted for 25% of the grade for the full year. Okay. And we were given a case study of a company about to do an IPO. And we had to price the IPO. And over there we had, you know, because of case studies, you had groups and group discussions. And my three other colleagues in my group had a certain price for the company shares after discussions. And I kind of disagreed with that price. And I came with a much lower price for the IPO of that company in America. And I submitted my paper and I got an F, oh. an F for fail for a course that was one fourth of my, of, 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 that, of that course for the year. And the reason I got the fail was because I was looking at the IPO from the perspective of the investor. So should the investor make money or not? And should the IPO be priced so that the investor makes money? And everyone else was looking at the price from the highest price that the company can get away with and maximize its share of a price. Not what the investor will do. From the perspective but, of an investment banker. Exactly. From a banker and the fees that come with it. So I got the F. But I guess in our whole life, and you know, you all have the example of Reliance Powers IPO, where you all gave a price which made it in the front page of newspapers, which was do not subscribe. I was not part of that research process. You all were. You all came up with the research. But it carried on that same ethos. You didn't get the F. You, know, you got the F on the day you wrote it. But you got an A++, I guess, from those investors who are thoughtful, <clears throat> from those investors who are sensible, from those investors who are not greedy and driven by greed, but are saying, India's going to grow, the economy is going to grow. How can I participate in that economic growth 
by investing in individual stocks or mutual funds as a case may be. And Equity Master gives a solution. Personal FN gives a solution. And Quantum Mutual Fund gives a solution. But the ethics in all remain. And I think that's why when I was interviewing you and you've got a better memory than I have, I could probably remember what I said, which would have been, you know, if you come across a traffic light and you're late for a meeting, you know, if you, if you, yes, right, no. if you, if you break that traffic light, it's red, you know you're going to make it for the interview and you know you're going to get a job. And if you stop at the traffic light, you know you're not going to make it to the interview and you may not get that job. What will you do? Right? That was one of the questions. Mm -hmm. And that all is about culture and ethos and ethics. And as, as I said then, uh, we can teach someone to be a very good research analyst in six months, 12 months, a great analyst within three years, a good fund manager within five years. But you can't teach ethics. That comes from what you've learned at home, from your parents, from your grandparents, from your friends, from your uncles, your aunts. It's that underlying sublime message that you grow up Absolutely. with. And other stuff, you know, you can teach everything else, but you can't teach that. Correct. I mean, I think we don't even mm -hmm. question it now. I think for most of us at Equity Master, it just comes intuitively to us. Mm -hmm. uh, we analyze anything, we look at IPOs, we you know, uh, look at companies, and we always put ourselves in the shoes of the retail investor, mm -hmm. and then analyze the thing, and then uh, ask whether this, uh, does this have the potential to make good money for a retail investor? You know. Re does it have the potential to earn good risk adjusted returns for the retail investor? Correct. And that just comes intuitively to us. Absolutely. Now, right? <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's second nature now. It's, it's second so, nature. so that's what kind of drove me, right? The studies. And then I had this fantastic professor, I was very lucky, who taught us ethics in business uh, in, in, in the MBA course in North Carolina, Professor Jack Behrman. And Professor Jack Behrman would host this course in the class, and when the doors opened, uh, it was basically a few Asian students who were in the front row and all the white-skinned American, if I can say that, were all in the back row. Whereas in the investment banking class, it was the opposite. The white-skinned Americans wanted to rush to the front of the class as soon as the door opened and occupy that chair so that they can hear the professor better and watch the screens better. And, you know, the rest of us had to struggle to get seats at the back. And it was complete the flip. And so ethics and business was... To me, like a strange course is like, really, you have to actually teach businessmen ethics. I didn't. I was naive. I assumed that all businesses were ethical, and um, and Jack Bevan effectively explained and taught me that's not the case. You know, uh, companies are not born with ethics. <clears throat> they don't have the DNA of ethics. Most of them, and you have to filter that, filter out those companies in your portfolio as you do, and you have to filter out the managements from your portfolio which don't subscribe to that long-term governance and long-term ethics. So, yeah, so that's part of the whole history of why it's ingrained across the group, as you mentioned. Now, another, uh, you know, memory of you is uh, when I was uh, just starting out as a research analyst, was you mentoring us, teaching us a group of, you know, the entire research team used to sit and Ajit used to uh, teach us investing and teach us how to value companies. And it was, I think, the meeting was a nice marriage of top-down view versus bottom-up view. Mm -hmm. uh, we all analysts used to, we, we used to be sector specialists and we used to, you know, uh, give views on our respective sectors and our respective companies. And Ajit used to give his top-down perspective. And I think that has sort of come to define your investment philosophy over mm -hmm. the years, marrying the bottom-up with the top-down. And, uh, you know, we value investors are thought that most of the times we are taught that you should ignore the, top, you know, uh, top-down view. And you should only focus on the bottom of you and uh, you can do a good job as an investor if you focus only on bottom up investing. But there are a few turning points every few years where, uh, you know, if you identify those turning points in advance, like the 2007-2008 crisis, mm -hmm. uh, imagine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, anticipating the crisis in advance and sitting on a lot of cash. And then when the market crashed, you had a lot of mm -hmm. cash to invest in stocks, 2020 before the COVID crisis. So most of the times, top-down may not work that well uh, and better off sticking to bottom-up. But there are these turning points every few years where if you get the timing right or if you, you know, anticipate them well in advance, it could make a huge difference to your overall returns. So can you uh, 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 
explain our, to our readers, you know, how to marry the two and sure. some of the important <clears throat> turning points that you've had in your career that yeah. made a huge difference. So at the time, uh, again, I have uh, finished my MBA in 1983. I worked in America for a year and I came back to India in 84. And then I worked with Mr. Ashok Birla, who taught me a lot about business and ethics, etc. <clears throat> and uh, that's where I got my learning and my ideas for setting up Quantum. And uh, in 1997, we had a joint venture with uh, Hansberger Global Investors. Tom Hansberger was the co-founder of what is now Franklin Templeton, in those days called Templeton Galbraith Hansberger. And they were the first international value investors, if you will, out of the US. And for example, they big bet against Japan. First, they invested in Japan, then Sir John Templeton felt Japan was too expensive and recommended selling and sold out just before the bubble burst in 1989. Uh, so, so that was history. And when I was working with Tom in Florida for about uh, seven years, one thing I realized was that they were looking only at valuations. And while they did look at uh, GDP and other macro indicators in different countries, they were not going deep enough. And having grown up in India, where you know government policy can decimate industries and businesses or give them huge leg up in some sense, you have to understand the macro a little better, not only globally, but also in the India-centric world. So we made sure that in our processes that we built, so we had joint ventures with Jardine Fleming, 92 to 95, then from with Hansberger, 97 to 2004. So all the stuff that we learned, things to do and things not to do, we made sure there was a macro overlay in what we did. And I'll give you one example. So I may believe, as I do, that uh, if I looked at my parents' age, no one wore bikinis and very few people learned how to swim. If I look at my generation, I'm, you know, I was born in 1960, so I'm 63 now, but I look at the generation born between 1960 and 70, many of us studied in India, studied abroad, have watched TV and are you know, swimming and more stuff. If I look at my children's generation, you know, they're in their mid-20s, early 30s, um, they've all bought bikinis and short swimming suits and whatever, so they all know how to swim, or they have a desire to learn how to swim, whichever way it is. So I'm sure that in India, over the next few decades, the, uh, the clothes that you wear around swimming will go through a massive sale, massive. So that's the bottom-up story for investing in a company that's making what we call swimming trunks or swimsuits. The top-down fear factor is, and this happened after a re an election some years ago, where a political party in Goa said, we're going to ban women from wearing bikinis on a beach. You just killed <laughs> half your market, right? So if you don't follow the top-down and you don't follow policy making that may change because of political events, you just lost half the market. Right? So uh, actually, you lost two-thirds of the market because a bikini is two things and a man's swimsuit is only one. So you lost two-thirds of the market effectively, right? So you have to be very cognizant of what rules are about eating beef, eating meat, drinking alcohol, swimming, traveling, women going to work and women traveling on work, is that allowed, not allowed? A lot of that dynamic. And if you don't follow um, government's uh, sort of ability to <clears throat> influence policy and change it, it will impact you know, the way you look at companies on a bottom-up basis. So you have to be aware of that. That's at a local level. At a global level, we saw what happened, a bunch of things that went wrong. So 2008, Lehman went bankrupt. 2008, uh, the Indian market fell by 50% after Lehman's bankruptcy over a few months, over five weeks. And the Indian currency lost about 25% in six months. So you had this massive double whammy if you're a foreign investor in India, where you've lost a rupee value of your stocks by half, and the currency has taken away a, a quarter. When we studied the impact of Lehman, of the bankruptcy of Lehman on the Indian economy, we struggled to find more than a 0.5 to 0.75% impact on GDP. So if the economy is growing at 6.5%, which it was roughly in those days, 7%, we struggled to find 
why the economy could not continue growing at 6 or 6.25%, even though there was a bankruptcy of Lehman and a financial shock globally. So that was the understanding again of the top-down impact or lack of impact of a financial event on the macroeconomy. So we actually came out with a statement to our international clients at that point in time saying that if you, gave, if you invested in our product, which is here known as a quantum long-term equity value fund, if you invested in our product in October, November, December of 2008, we could see a return of 100% to 180% in that three-month period, two years in the future. So October, November 2010, you would make 100 to 180 percent. A lot of that from the expansion in multiples itself. No, just from the fact that the economy was not hit and companies that we held in the portfolio were still going to predict and we estimate have the cash flows that we thought they would have. And it was just a micro call, a bottom-up call, recognizing that what happened in the U.S. with the Lehman bankruptcy had no impact or minimal impact on India completely different from what the stock market anticipated. So earnings growth was more or less intact? Plus Absolutely intact. Of good companies, re -raising, re -raising. with good management, good. with good balance sheets, yeah. right? No leverage and all that stuff. If you had leverage, you were in trouble yeah, because you had to refinance your leverage at higher rates and all that stuff went wrong. And if you had international borrowings, more so. You were bust because no international group was going to relend money to India having lost money in currency and with a global financial crisis on their hand. So if you were borrowing money from the foreign banks, you were in trouble. But so the blue chip companies were sound financial. Absolutely yeah. fine. And go back, look at the look at the NAV of the quantum long-term equity value fund on September 15th and September 30th, 2008. And look at the NAV, you know, two years later. And you'll see that. It's like pretty much one-to-one -to, -one to what we expected. So, you know, that again is process that you're able to understand, watch, evaluate, assimilate what's happening globally, but then say, yes, it matters or no, it doesn't matter. COVID mattered, right? COVID was an event in March 2020 the that impacted the, the world the and impacted the earnings. Yeah. So you know there was something wrong there. So you have to, disem you have to you figure out and analyze what's impactful and what's noise in some sense. I've always admired your ability to you know, simplify things, uh, complex things and put them in a language that even uh, a layman would understand. And I think this is just an example of that. Amazing. Uh, so now, uh, using that investment philosophy to maybe try and predict what's going to happen three to five years from now. Uh, normally, you know, we have our spreadsheets for companies mm -hmm. and there are these macro assumptions that we need to make there. And for many years, these macro assumptions were, you know, in Indian economy will grow at seven, eight percent. Inflation would be four, five percent. Rupee would depreciate at two, three percent. But now there are a lot of these structural changes that are happening both internationally as well as locally. Locally, we have, uh, you know, a lot of liquidity that's coming into the market, mm -hmm. uh, economic growth is good. Internationally, uh, I read somewhere that Harvard Marks, who's a very famous investor in the yes. US, uh, he said that uh, there has been a sea change that, that's happening in the market, in the US market. And he gave an example of in 1980, he borrowed money for his house at 22.5%. Correct. In 2020, he borrowed money at 2.25%. Correct. So from 22.5% to 2.25%, that was a sea change in his view. Uh, and a lot of the growth in the U.S. stock markets was because of interest rates coming all the way down to zero. But that is changing now. Uh, I think uh, we are in an era where, uh, you know, zero interest rates are gone. They should go back up. So in light of these changes that are happening both internationally as well as domestically, you know, how do you see the next three to five years panning out? So, so I should say that I have a lot of respect for Howard Mark. I actually, uh, Marks, I spoke with him on a platform in America way back when, 2000, 2001, uh, when you know value was making a comeback after the Nasdaq collapse. Nasdaq surged in 99, July to December with the tech bubble and then collapsed in from February 2000. And then value came back and things. So I was invited to Chicago and he and I were on a panel together. But, but to go back to what, what Howard Marks experienced is that Firstly, he should never have borrowed at 22.5% in 1980. <laughs> Bad judgment. But he should have borrowed a lot more at 2.5. So yes, we are in an environment where globally, interest rates which have been just on a one-way downward trend are going to normalize. 
So going back 50, 60 years in history, you'll find that the U.S. 10-year bond, which is the safest so far risk-free asset in the world, has given about a 4.5, 4.75% rate of, that's the average yield. And it came down to like nothing, to below 1%. And effective well, to about one percent or so, and then it's now went up to five, flirted with five, and as of now back to four point five percent. But it is not going to be one or two percent anymore. That I think is a given, uh, largely because of inflation, and also because there is competition for money that's going to happen in the global space. Japan has kept its yield, its 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 own interest rates, very low, remarkably low. So as of now, I was reading recently that the inflation in Japan is at roughly 7% and interest rates in Japan are 1%. So they've got a negative 6%, which explains why the yen, the Japanese yen, has been weak. And finally, the Japanese Central Bank and the, and, and the Finance Ministry have sort of agreed that the yield control of the 1% is not a target, but a reference point, i.e., interest rates are going to creep up. And the reason why I say there'll be competition is uh, governments have issued so much debt uh, post Lehman bankruptcy, the global financial crisis, and post COVID around the world. And they've got to refinance that debt or they've got to repay it. Repay, they have to have surpluses of budget, which they don't have. They have deficits, so they're financing more. So they've got to refinance all these bonds. And in Japan, if interest rates are going to go up from 1% to 2 or 3 you'll find investors buying Japanese bonds. So for the U.S. to compete, they'll have to raise their interest rates. So there'll be two reasons why rates will go up. One is inflation, which is what the initial reason was for interest rates to start going up. Even if they control inflation over the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, there will still be competition, competition for savings. And there will be this competitive increase in rates that will be that will keep rates relatively high to what we've seen. They won't go back to 20%, but they'll certainly not be at 1% and 2% levels that you saw for a decade plus since 2008-9. Um, and when your risk-free rate changes, even in India, you'll have the government bond won't change much. It'll be 7% or so where it is now. Um, but you'll find that the risk-free rate, in our case, the government 10-year bond, in the U.S. case, the U.S. 10-year bond, in Japan, their bond, when the risk-free rate increases, your demand for return in any asset class will increase, right? because now I'm taking more risk, whether it's real estate, whether it's bonds issued by a private sector corporation, or whether it's stock market returns. There'll be premium on that risk-free rate. So take the US, for example. The average return going back decades for the S&P 500 in the United States is about 6.5% per annum. That's the average return. If the government bond is now 4.5%, to be an investor, which, which is what the historical average has been, you got that 6.5%. So about 200 basis points equity risk premium. The extra return that you demand from stocks for being in risky stocks compared to riskless government of US bond. So luckily in the Indian market, with the government bond being roughly about 7% in the last few years, the rate of return for stock should be maybe two, 300 basis points above the risk-free rate. So you should be earning 9% or 10% on equity. Luckily, returns in India have been far superior than that. If you go back from 1980, which we compiled data, you earned about roughly 17 to 18% per annum compounded. Of course, rates of interest and inflation were higher in the early 80s and early 90s than they are today. And going forward, if I can make a trajectory of, you said, the next few years, I think I'm not going to look at three years, five years. That to me is too short. I look at 10 years and 15 years. I think the rate of return from Indian stocks will be about 15% per annum, 1.5, which is slightly lower than the 18, 17, 18% of the past, but very respectable given that you're beginning from a high base. And to me, I know equity is a risk list, is a risky asset. I consider equity in Indian markets with India's GDP as a pretty low risk asset. The risk I think investors have is the risk they put on themselves, which is the greed, 
the rush to make quick money, not listening to what Equity Master has to say and what Rahul Shah and Tanushri and Richa have to write, and not being a thoughtful investor. So in Quantum Mutual Fund, we've actually built a fantastic enterprise where you have ready-made portfolios. You don't have to come to Rahul Shah and Tanushri and Richa to get views. But if you're lazy and you don't really have the time or the energy or the inclination, you can get a modest rate of return, lower than probably coming to you all because you all pick stocks and individuals pick the portfolios, but riding that wave. And the, the problem, I, I would say, from an investor perspective is they find quantum boring, the mutual fund boring. They find like, why is there no excitement? Why can't we make a 25% rate of return? They forget the power of compounding, right? Warren Buffett said one of the best things in the world is just the power of compounding. You compound 15% per annum from when Quantum launched you know, the long-term value fund at 10 rupees in March 2006, and today's 94 or 95, whatever the NAV is, you've compounded at 14%, 15%, which is fantastic. Without taking, a lot of without taking any risk in such. And on a tax basis, a smart thing to do because you're just leaving the money there, and now you're paying long-term capital gains based on the new regime, which keeps on changing, and you're running a fantastic wealth creation enterprise while not focusing much on it. And you come to Richa, you come to Tanushri, you come to Rahul, you probably make a higher rate of return because you're advising and then individuals are listening to you all and building their own portfolios. So they can do that. But the opportunity to make money in a growing economy like India, and we don't believe the 7-8%. Our view on India is more a 6.5% rate of growth in real rate of growth in GDP over the next decade. We're not believers in seven or eight. I think a lot of things on the infrastructure side, on the supply side, bottleneck side, on government policy making side need to change for seven, eight to be sustainable. You may get spurts of it, but not sustainable. So I'm very, very optimistic on India. I remain a massive bull. I've been a bull since I first discovered the Indian markets in 1977 when we had all the divestments of the FEMA companies, those days called FEDA, when, uh, uh, you know, when you forced uh, Colgate and Lever and all to uh, sell you shares at a ridiculously calculated price, even, even lower than my F grade price for an IPO, uh, which I got in UNC. So yeah, I've been a big bull on India, but I do recognize that there are moments in time when valuations are stretched, if not crazy, and you have to be sensible and recognize, as you indicated, to sell or trim and hold cash and wait for valuations in a post-SARS uh, period, in a post-Lehman period, in a post-COVID period to just jump in. Or, or when election results were announced uh, in different cycles, when markets collapsed, when the Atal Bihari Vajpayee government lost an election 2004, okay. markets fell by 25% in a week. Great time to buy because honestly, uh, governments which are coalitions do not disrupt markets. Governments that are single party have the power to disrupt markets. Oh. And we can talk about that more <laughs> later, towards the end, after I bought my insurance policy. <laughs> so to summarize what you just said, I mean, if you have an investment horizon of 10 years, you can still expect your stocks to earn 14 to 15% per annum. Mm -hmm. That's like a reasonable assumption to make. Right? Yeah. Without taking undue risk. I'm not talking about illiquidity risk of small cap, strange managements, none of that. Those are roll the dice, you know, that you can increase your chance of making more returns or probably lose some capital. Since you just mentioned about small caps, uh, I know that you just launched mm -hmm. a small cap fund, so congratulations for that. <clears throat> but I think a few weeks back we were having a discussion and I asked you that, you know, why launch a small cap fund now? Because we are at the peak of the, you know, small cap bull mm -hmm. market, small cap index that is at its peak. And then uh, you like just smiled and pulled out a sheet of paper. And on, on that was a table where you had listed the biggest small cap funds in India and the number of stocks each one of them had in their yes. portfolios. And I was a little surprised to see that some of the biggest funds uh, had become nothing but index huggers. Uh, from active, they had, they had become passive funds where they had invested in you know hundreds of stocks. And uh, it was very difficult for me to believe that, you know, how by holding so many stocks, they'll be able to beat the market because they were more or less the index. And you said, this is uh, what we are going to challenge. 
uh, we are going to bring some active component to the entire small cap universe and that's why you said that you launched a small cap mm-hmm. fund and uh, and, and could you just elaborate on that? Sure. Idea? So I'll, I'll, I'll make two statements. One is that <clears throat> you, you mentioned the peak, that the small caps are at a peak. I argued by saying, I countered by saying that the quantum long-term value fund was launched in March 2006, uh, in Feb 2006, and we closed the NFO in March that 2006. Was again, uh, close to market peak. That was a peak that time of the BSC 30 yeah, and, yeah, the, yes. and the large caps. And we went from an NAV of 10 to NAV of 94. And the index went from 6,000 to 60,000. 60, so, you know, you've seen that growth uh, effectively. And even now, while the in- index looks a bit frothy, I agree with that on valuation, uh, it's at a peak, but so is the Indian economy. And the Indian economy has got more peaks to go. And the BSC 30 index has more peaks to go. And the small cap index has more right. peaks to go. So there's more peaks in the future. What attracted us to the space was two things. One is... We've been trying to do a small cap fund since 2013. And we're very clear that unless we find a process that makes sense, that is repeatable, like I can judge and I can estimate, I told you, the net asset value of the quantum long-term value fund. I said, go back and look at our data in September 2008 and September 2010 and, you know, September, October, December, uh, November, December of 2008 and, you know, September, October, December of 2010. And you'll see how we can estimate it. Uh, we want a repeatable process in some sense. A process is repeatable. If I buy a Mercedes car or a BMW car or a Maruti car, and if the capacity of that factory is one million cars, I don't call them up and say, which car have I got in the one million? Because the first car or the millionth car should have the same quality. So in a very similar way, a portfolio should have characteristics that are replicable and repeatable and predictable. We've taken it one step further by trying to estimate our returns. And we fully recognize that past performance is definitely no indication of future performance. And the only predictable thing in the world really is the US 10-year bond, where if the government of USA says, I owe you this bond, I'm going to give you 4.5% interest, then you know after 10 years, the government of the US is still going to be there and you'll have corrected 4.5% interest. Everything else is sort of not predictable, including the government of India, right? I mean, which is why they're in the the rating scale of S&P or a crystal or whatever, they're different grades. So US, of course, has recently lost its AAA for what's happening there, but in general, they're more believable than India would be or Egypt would be or Indonesia would be or, or even UK would be in some sense. So that's a predictable number. And we built this process for predicting uh, our NAVs. In the small cap space, we haven't yet uh, firmed up the NAV prediction power, if you will, but we firmed up the portfolio construction. Okay. We know that we're not going to be the index. We know we're going to take bets against the index. We're going to be 25 to 50 stocks, so fairly concentrated. Uh, compared to the other funds you mentioned, which have 200 stocks and 150 stocks and over 100 stocks, and they become like the index, although they charge you active fees, they're behaving like a passive fund. So we saw the opportunity in the market space in that sense. We understood a process to identify managements of smaller companies with less access to skilled managements, less access to inexpensive capital, and who are growing. So there's a growth story. So there are risks in the small cap space, which is very different from the long-term value space where you have longer track records, deeper managements, access to capital, very different space. But we found, we believe we have a process. Now time will tell. The fund is being invested. Its first NAV will be declared shortly. And then people will watch it and see whether these guys are talking sense or not. But we are not in the business in quantum mutual fund we are not in the business of being the best performing fund. We're in the business of assessing risk, calibrating risk, pricing risk, and building you a portfolio that will give you sensible rates of return, which is why in 1996, after a bad experience and a lot of learning from my joint venture with Jardine Fleming from 1992 to 1995, we were pretty much the first joint venture with a foreign group in in the country, after the reform started. We have not bought a single Reliance stock 
an Adani stock, a Vedanta stock, an SR stock, and a bunch of others. Not because we don't like the businesses. They don't fit, your they don't fit the process. They don't fit the processes that we have, which are pricing, which are assessing, calibrating, and pricing risk. Now, have we done well? We've done well. We've given you a rate of return. The index has all these stocks in them. The index doesn't price and assess risk. The index makers only want to know what is the liquidity of the stock, how much do you trade, market. and what's your market cap. They don't care about anything else. They don't make forecasts on EPS either. right? So when you're buying the index, you're buying blind. When you're buying into a fund, hopefully an active fund, hopefully the fund manager has made some predictions about the business of the company. And hopefully, certainly in our case, with the integrity screen we have, we sift out what we think are risks for your portfolio. So we are not trying to maximize return. We're trying to assess risk and give you the safest way, possible way, to make that 15% rate of return in equity without taking undue risk of a satyam, et cetera, et cetera, along the way. Uh, are we always right? No, we make our mistakes. I can talk about Yes Bank. We did not buy Yes Bank in the, in the initial years. We bought Yes Bank in Quantum Mutual Fund after Rana Kapoor was called out. And when the RBI put a board member on the seat, so we were waiting for the governance to get cleaned out. And it did. And we made a brilliant, it sounded brilliant when we made the investment in, the, in that September, October year. Uh, because we made 30, 40% return in our share investment in three, four months. By wow. January of the following year, we were like feeling, oh, wow, great call. And then, you know, things went horrible because their new CEO went in front of analysts and said, I have a hole in my bank. I don't know the size. I don't know how big it is. And I also have no idea how I'm going to fund it. Now, if you're a bank and you say, I've got a problem, and I don't know how to fix the problem, you just kill the bank. And the share price collapsed. And sadly, we lost our ca capital pretty much. Uh, we got a, had a huge loss of capital from that investment. So we make mistakes. But the mistake over there was trusting the RBI to be on board and to do what they should have done, as opposed to the RBI being a passive you know, person out there and watching this whole thing unfold and collapse. So to me, if I have to blame one person for the, RBI, for the collapse, it's the RBI. Because they were, not, they were not doing their job of being on the board like we thought. And RBI comes on the board, great, trust them. So do I trust the Indian bond at 7%? No, a lot less today than I did before. <laughs> no, I still like the RBI a lot. Don't get me wrong. They're a great regulator. They've done fantastic things. But that, R, but that one thing in Yes Bank hurt us a lot. <laughs> So I do hold that against the RBI a bit. Anyways, that's a brilliant point that you mentioned. Uh, and not just useful in portfolio management, but when we manage our own individual investments as well. Uh, don't set out to beat the market. Uh, have a process, have a risk management system in place. And if by virtue of that, if by virtue of following the process and following the risk management, if you beat the market, it's well and good. Otherwise, earning a couple of points less than the market is fine as long as, you know. Yeah, I, I like to clarify. I mean, we have yes, beaten the index yeah, yeah, over long periods of time. But there are periods of time when value right, right. falls out of favor. There are periods of time, you take the case of 2000. While all of us are locked in at home, Reliance has done deals with Google, Facebook, I mean, you name it. And the share price surged. Half of the gain in the index in the calendar year 2020 right, yeah. was Reliance. Half of the gain in the index. So if the index gained 20%, I think it was, in that year, 10% came from Reliance stock. right? And we didn't own it. So we look like idiots for not owning it, it, right? It did not fit your process. It yeah. didn't fit our process. So right. we will have those moments in time. And I'm not saying don't buy those stocks. I'm just saying our process doesn't allow those stocks to come into our portfolio. Of course, you can buy any stock you want based upon your risk adjustment and your risk level that you wish to take. Go and, you know, you can buy Bitcoin. You can do anything you want to do. But the process that we built uh, don't allow us to buy certain stocks. And that was one of the stocks that we could not buy and that hurt us. Let's talk about India a bit. Uh, mm -hmm. India is the toast of the world, I guess. Uh, we've got a lot of things going uh, for us. Uh, we've got the demographic dividend. A lot of infrastructure buildup is happening in India. Uh, you know, the entire world is looking at India as the next China, maybe even bigger than that. Uh, they say that this is India's decade. This is India's century. 
but uh, I want you to sort of give the counter argument to that. Uh, you know, what can sort of derail the India's growth story and uh, what are the big risks that you see that, you know, are staring, st staring at us in the face, but we are sort of ignoring it. Uh, so say. I'm not going to give you a counter because I believe in India. Okay. But of course, I recognize risks. The, v the very first thing you said about the demographic dividend. So at the time of the brick madness, Goldman Sachs, Sir Jim O'Neill coined the phrase brick. Brazil, Russia, India, India, China. Nothing common between those four, barring the fact that we all happen to be emerging, econ emerging economies, each for different reasons, potentially having high growth. Russia doesn't have a big population. China does. India does. Brazil does not. Russia has resources. Brazil has resources. India is resource hungry. China resource hungry. So, you know, there were different dynamics, nothing common really per se. But in that brick moment, um, Sir Jim O'Neill and the team from Goldman came down to India. They gave a presentation at the President Hotel, which I attended, 2004, I think it was. And, um, you know, when they finished the talk, I was in the front row. When they finished the talk, I raised oh. my hand and I said, you know, I have a question. And the question was, uh, how did you assume that all those people looking for a job got a job and contributed to GDP? And the response that came from the Goldman team was we assumed that the government came out with policies to give the young people jobs. Okay, that's a nice assumption. <laughs> and I said, as a value investor, you have to understand, as any investor, you have to understand government policy making. And I've not seen a white paper in 2004 from the government on job creation, nor did I see it in 2005, 6, 7, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but so the demographic dividend could become, even today, a demographic nightmare. We're 20 years on roughly from when the BRIC acronym was created and branded as a great marketing tool for emerging market investment. And 20 years on, we still have a situation where the young people are coming into the job market and they're not finding jobs. Um, and I could spend a lot of hours on labor participation rates. I just got a nice briefing from Pankaj, who's the fixed income head at Quantum AMC. And he was talking about labor participation came down because people were not looking for jobs. They were looking for to save their lives and they went home. So they were not looking for a job. So their participation or desire to work collapsed and came down to 45% or below, came down to 40% at the time of COVID, oh, yes. and now creeping up back again. And as more people are looking for jobs again, they're not finding them. So these are people who stepped out of the job market and came into the job market, and younger people graduating from engineering schools, colleges, looking for jobs. So you're seeing the CMI data, unemployment is rising. When we heard, going back in history, when we heard this from Brick, from uh, the Goldman team, about demographic dividend, we very quickly did a calculation that there were roughly 10 million people who would come into the job market every year. That worked out to 27,700 jobs to be created every day in India. Every New jobs day. every day for these people to absorb them. 27,700. We looked at the other end of the spectrum, the developed world, the United States, Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the original G7 as they're called, 30,000 people retiring every day in those economies. They have a different problem. People are getting old and the cost of keeping them alive and they're living longer and the cost of keeping them alive because of healthcare cost is mushrooming. They got a pension problem. So if you look at the pensions of California, of New York State, of Chicago, Illinois, the big states, if their pension liability is 100, they have assets worth only 85 or 90. They are underfunded. They have no idea how they're going to solve that problem. So, but think about this. If you're 85 years old and you're living in small town America in the middle of nowhere, where most people live, unlike in India, where people live in cities more and more. In America, they live in rural India. And so 85 years old in rural, in, uh, you're rural America, you're, you don't get your pension check or the pension check is half of what you thought you would get. What will you do at the age of 85? What are you going to do? Well, you have to cut down on your expenses. You have to cut down on your cost or you just roll over and die. 
you're not going to walk 200 miles or drive 200 miles, probably don't have a car at that age, to go to the center of the state legislature and protest. Now take the Indian example. You're young, you're 22 years old, you're 25 years old, you're 28 years old. You've just graduated. You just finished some kind of schooling, some kind of university, some kind of diploma, and you're looking for a job. And you don't get a job. Now what are you going to do? Full of rage and energy. Full of rage and anger. The Arab Spring, which created this whole torpedo and sort of domino effect, if you will, in the Middle East for freedom, the Arab Spring will look like a Sunday picnic because the number of people who will protest in India will be 10 times what you saw in that wave of Arab Spring-like activity. 10 times. That is why Narega is the most important tool created by previous governments and enhanced by this government. Recognize that initially during campaigning, this government nine years ago had said they will try to do away with Narega as they were going to do away with Aadhaar. Thank God they kept Aadhaar and they kept Narega. It is the one fantastic tool to deliver money, goods, services, oil, gas, cylinders, food, whatever you want, by keeping both these uh, pr projects alive. And you've seen the numbers for Narega. They are leapfrogging. And that shows distress at the rural level. It shows distress at the bottom of the triangle, at the bottom of the pyramid. It shows distress across rural India. And that is a worrying factor. The great thing, of course, like to go back again, is that the governments recognize that. The governments have the tools and the ability to send subsidy, what they call direct benefit programs, electronically, very quickly, without the middleman stealing. And as long as governments in the state level and at the central level keep at with this, we're safe. And every time in the budget, for God's sake, if you hear more allocation to Narega, you look at the BSE 30 index, it comes down. Because the BSE 30 index or the, any index in the market represents wealth creation, short term, market cap. And they think of that as a negative. As an Indian, as a member of the society, you should stand up and applaud a government which gives money allocation to Narega, which increases allocation to Narega. That's your insurance. That is your insurance to ensure that society does not crumble. And that is, there are two risks in India. One is this, the demographic dividend becomes a demographic no. disaster, right? That's one risk, which hopefully Narega and Aadhaar and the digitalization of direct benefits takes care of. In addition to government policies for, you know, job creation. We did, we did a study years ago, I don't know how accurate it is today. We did a study years ago that in India, so like I said, 10 million new jobs every year, drivers, are 3 million. The demand for drivers can be 3 million a year in this country. Now, if you got a job at Infosys or Wipro or HDFC Bank or whatever, you're not going to be sitting in a train, which is a mess in cities, buses that are non-existent in most cities, barring, I think Bombay's got a great bus service, other cities don't. And metros are frightfully expensive and may not be reliable, who knows, they're yet to be built and they'll take time to get built. You may buy a small car, and you're not going to spend your time necessarily driving that car two hours in traffic. Hire You'll hire a driver. We also did an analysis of, of driving licenses. At that time, we found that if you need 3 million or 30 lakh drivers in a year, the capacity of driving license was 2.5 lakhs. Now, you know, we assumed that corruption was not so high at the DMV level, at the Department of Driving, of uh, issuing a dri license level, but which is probably explains why there's so many accidents because people may not have gone the whole driving test to actually get the license. They may get it in a short circuit in a faster way. And that's why your road deaths in, America, in India per kilometer driven are 10 times that of the US, right? We have 1.6 lakh, I think, road deaths every year. And we drive nothing compared to what America drives. And yet we have high number of deaths. So the demographic disaster is one concern. The other concern that I have on why India may not play out is the lack of government ability to take advantage of a situation. 
So you spoke about China and clearly China is a problem for the world. And there's now a China plus one strategy. The question is, what are we doing about it? What are we doing about inviting bond investments, real estate investments, infrastructure investments, portfolio stock market investments, and of course, multinational investments? The answer is not a lot. Uh, we may come out with this plans once in a while to do import substitution sort of thing, which was there in the 1980s and in the 1990s, we've rebranded it. Um, and you get that moving along, maybe. No, not, that's not enough in my view. And taxation is a pain. No foreign investor pays tax in most global markets when they invest. But they pay tax when they come to India. They don't like that. So when we talk to a foreign pension fund, they say, you know, the problem with investing in India is that I can invest in any other market and I have to beat that market and 10% more because that's your tax rate in India for long term. Why should I pay that? So unless the government recognizes that you're in a competitive environment and accepts this money more easily without the label that, oh, it's foreign money, why should we give it advantage? No, you're playing on a level playing field in a global sphere. You either play that level playing field or you put a hurdle of 10% or 20% or 30% tax and you don't get the outcomes that will be beneficial to India. So till today, the ratio of foreign investment in China, foreign portfolio flows to India is four to one. Four to China, one to India. The foreign investment in multinational kind of investment, FDI has been six to one, eight to one, much higher. So they all need different policies. The portfolio one is easy, that's tax. The multinational is so much, right? Licensing, labor laws, supply chain, so many things that have to be fixed. And unless the government actually does this on a war footing, you may lose the opportunity. Geopolitically, if you're reading the little straws in the wind, the US is already trying to be a little more friendly to China and more accommodative to China. That's not good for us. If we are playing off a China is not liked and therefore we will benefit story. Because in our, our own strength is not really that strong. Our strength in the geopolitical world today is we can be the proxy against a China. That's a defensive thing. It's not, a, it's not, an, it's not talking to your advantage. It's talking to the weakness of a, com, of, of a competitor. When that weakness disappears, you've lost your advantage. So I worry about these things. Having said all that, this is all geopolitical stuff. And you know, I, do, I do worry about the labor situation and the, and the lack of employment in India. But I think India, 6.5% GDP for the next 10, 15 years is a given. India, 15% stock market rate of returns is a given. From that, you judge your level of risk. You want to make a high rate of return, you take the higher risk. You don't want to make the high return, you want good risk adjusted returns. Talk to Rahul, talk to Tanishri, talk to Richard, and talk to Quantum Mutual Fund. I think it was a fascinating conversation. A lot of learnings personally for me. And I think audience will also think the same when they watch this. Uh, it was amazing, amazing to have you, Ajit. And hoping to see you again sometime in the near future. Thank you so much for your insights. Pleasure to be here, really. Thank you so much for hosting me. And I'm really glad that you brought back memories <laughs> of July 2003, which has been about 20 years. Correct. And I'm really happy to know that Equity Master as a team has kept that ethos, kept that focus, and kept that within the ability. So I always say there are two things that I value very much, integrity and competence. So you all have demonstrated in my eyes both. So well done, very, very means, well done for that. It means so much to us. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. And we hope you all have had a great Diwali and a, we'll have a great New Year. And all the best to you all. Thank you. Happy Diwali from me as well. Happy Diwali and a prosperous New Year.